I'd like to introduce Ang Su Ko, who's a staff specialist radiation oncologist at um, Liverpool. Uh, she's has extensive experience in, in brain tumours, um, having done fellowships in Canada after doing her training at Westmead Hospital. So uh, if you can join me in thanking Su welcoming Sue to the stage. Thanks, Jonathan. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I know it's mid-afternoon, so if you need a 30-second stretch or a star jump, please go ahead and do that. Um, so I'm going to try and catch up a little bit of time, be quite brief, and essentially, because this is Brain Cancer Action Week, I'm just going to really take the next 15, 20 minutes to talk about some general principles as they relate to radiation treatment. I'm very aware that many people in the room, families have experienced radiation obviously firsthand, and so obviously bring a, a very specific experience to that. Um, so hopefully w what I say will complement your experience. So I tend to think of radiation as something in the middle. Clearly what, you've, uh, what I hope you've heard today is that we work really as specialist teams, very much integrated, and radiation is really an important treatment which often comes in obviously after the initial surgical procedure is done and perhaps together then or before chemotherapy and other targeted therapies. So. Um, in view of the fact that it's 2015 Brain Cancer Action Week, I'm going to cover these four points in that acronym. So start off by talking about what are some of the benefits of radiation treatment for brain tumours. Importantly, and as I alluded to this morning, what are some of the concerns or some of the side effects that patients can experience during or after radiation treatment. Um, touch again on some of the many advances in the technology as it relates to radiation delivery. And finally, some closing thoughts about what is the way forward in terms of radiation. So actually, a surgeon explained radiation better than I ever could this morning, Jacob. Well done. So it really explained the mechanism of radiation. But as he said, radiation, standard external beam radiation, is delivered by this quite large machine called a linear accelerator, or a LINAC for short. And the most common type of radiation is external beam, and it's delivered in what we call megavoltage photon radiation. So that's much more many, sort of more magnitudes greater than your everyday chest X-ray or CT scan. And it's similar in that it's invisible, it's painless treatment. You lie on a, a, a treatment couch, very similar to a diagnostic CT or an MRI scanner. And as you can see from that picture there, the machine can rotate around in 360 degrees actually. So the patient themselves is not moving, but the machine is moving around you. And what radiation does is it basically um, damages the tumour cells at their DNA level. Um, but this graph basically explains why it works as a radiation treatment. So tumour cells, because they have ab aberrant DNA pathways, are not able to recover after they're hit by radiation. But normal brain, brain tissue cells, pardon me, are able to actually repair over time. And the conventional way of delivering radiation is a little bit of small dose every day, Monday to Friday, over a course or a block of treatment, generally five, perhaps six weeks. So it's fairly intensive treatment for that six week period, but it's safe and it's tolerable and it's effective when delivered like that the conventional way. So the benefits of radiation, well, um, not to give you the details so much of this graph, which is actually quite old now, but patients were recruited back in the 1960s, 1970s. There was a clear benefit to radiation emerging in that era. And it, there's no doubt that radiation is a survival prolonging or life prolonging treatment in the context, particularly of high grade glioma. And we know some of the early trials show that radiation head to head with chemotherapy was superior. And as I mentioned, uh, in the glioblastoma setting, radiation is very standard to which temozolomide is added. And that really was actually now 10 years ago, uh, the landmark, as Jacob said, game changer trial published a decade ago by Roger Stupp from Switzerland showing that it was not just radiation, but the radiation plus temozolomide chemotherapy in the blue line, which showed a modest survi survival improvement. But as we follow those patients out two, three, four, five years, the patients receiving chemotherapy and radiation together did much better. So I think the common theme about radiation that it is actually a very precise, targeted local treatment. So in a way, it is quite similar in principle to surgery. It's a local way of treating various tumours. And the, the, the means by which we can deliver that precision treatment is 
several several key items. Firstly, for a patient having brain radiation, they need to have a, a thermoplastic immobilisation mask. The mask in this particular image is a little bit lower down, perhaps more for head and neck treatment, um, but you can understand how that device works. And it essentially conforms to the patient's profile and head and clips down to the table and doesn't allow much movement. It's designed to be quite rigid, but as you can see, patients can breathe and see through that mask. We, a standard, um, piece of equipment in every radiotherapy centre around Australia and internationally would be a CT simulator. So as you can see, it actually looks identical to a diagnostic CAT scanner, but there are added um, technological um, sort of apparatus added to it, which actually simulates or plans a radiation treatment. So it basically mocks up, as it were, the actual treatment. Uh, we prepare everything, and then the patient actually has their treatment delivered. Now this particular photo was taken from my time in Canada, which um, in Toronto, where they have a very large comprehensive cancer centre, that was an MRI and a simulator. And actually at Liverpool, we're very fortunate to have an in-house, as in an MRI in our cancer therapy department that we can use for radiation planning. So all the benefits of MRI in terms of the um, beautiful delineation of anatomy and also exactly where the tumour is are merged together with our simulator or planning function for optimal treatment visualisation. I'm just going to show you a couple of images now of um, what we call radiation dose maps or what we call isodose maps. So if you look at this image, you'll appreciate that where there is the same colour means that the same dose is being delivered. And to give you a sense of this particular patient had a right temporal glioblastoma. And you can hopefully appreciate that what we do is we target where the surgical cavity was, that is where the tumour was excised. And importantly, with radiation, we need to actually treat a margin of a margin around the original surgical cavity that we estimate might contain microscopic tumour cells and then we add a further small margin for, to account for everyday slight setup variation and I'm talking about one or two or three millimetres of daily setup variation. So the take home message from this isodose map is that radiation is by no means what it was like 50 years ago. It's extremely precise. It's very well sculpted around the area that we need to treat. The high dose region is very targeted and we do our best to spare critical structures that are adjacent to and particularly the healthy brain tissue on the, particularly on the other side of the brain. This is actually um, an image of a stereotactic radiosurgical planning system. And just to say that I acknowledge there will be people here and families affected by benign brain tumours. This was a meningioma case where um, you can probably appreciate this meningioma here right sort of next to the right orbit and the right optic nerve. And um, this really couldn't be excised fully surgically without risk to those structures and radiation was used to really precisely sculpt the tumour but importantly protect uh, the optic apparatus, particularly the right optic nerve and the chiasm behind it or the crossing point. These are all very important principles of modern radiation. So moving then to the second point, which, uh, which is what are the concerns related to radiation? And I said this morning, I'm actually very reluctant to give radiation unless there's a very good rationale for giving it. So there are some side effects associated with radiation as outlined here. In the short term, for patients going through their five or six week course of radiation, there are some temporary side effects, particularly including fatigue, some patchy hair loss, particularly in the treated area, depending on how the beam configuration is, how the beams enter and exit through the scalp. There is a, usually a mild scalp reaction, a mild sort of sunburn, which is temporary and self-limiting. And I would say about maybe 10% to 15% of patients might experience some increase in pressure symptoms or headache or some mild nausea. And those are symptoms that can be very well controlled with tablets. In the medium term, so what does one experience when they've completed their radiation or just after in the period of weeks to months? I really, I think the most protracted symptom is that of fatigue or what we sometimes call somnolence. So sort of being very sleepy or tired and just lack of energy. And those things can persist for, honestly, could be a month or two afterwards or even perhaps longer. Uh, remembering that patients go on to have other treatments such as chemotherapy after radiation as well. I think importantly, especially for patients with perhaps the lower grade um, brain tumours, lower grade gliomas, we know that radiation can be associated with more delayed side effects. 
in particular effects on cognitive function that we spoke about in the panel this morning. But there are also some important side effects, particularly with pituitary function, if the tumour uh, cavity or tumour is located near the central hormone gland called the pituitary gland, there can be some hormone um, effects, particularly low-level hormones over time that need to be managed uh, with an endocrinologist or hormone specialist. And I think many of us in the room are all too familiar with the long-term side effects of steroids, which are often used um, around the time of surgery, but also during radiation and chemo. I guess the second concern, which is a more of a pra practical one, is well, how long should one wait, ideally, to start radiation after they've had surgery? And I just flagged this one study, which is now 15 years old, which was actually from Westmead, done by one of my colleagues there, and recruited up almost 200 patients with high-grade glioma, both grade 3 and grade 4 glioblastoma. And they essentially had two definitions of wait times. Wait time from biopsy or surgical procedure to starting radiation, and waiting from presenting or consulting a radiation oncologist to the actual start of radiation. And the, the findings were quite striking in that they actually showed that patients who are older, patients who had a lower, slightly lower radiation dose, and those who waited longer to commence the radiation actually had um, less good outcomes. And in fact, this graph is even more striking, telling us that perhaps, perhaps each week of waiting to start radiation can actually impact on overall outcome. Now, I'll just flag, you know, that this um, is quite an old study now, and I would say with confidence most study, most centres around New South Wales and around Australia are more cognizant of the need to start radiation quite quickly. And we do know that these are quite rapidly proliferating tumours. The final concern I just want to draw to our attention is, and it's actually a question that um, the lady asked this morning, uh, was, is further radiation possible in the future? So can you have re-irradiation or second time radiation? And that's quite a tricky question to answer. And so some of the principles related to, to that issue are usually not. Usually it's not needed or required along the journey. It's normally a once-off treatment, particularly the conventional treatment over five or six weeks. But as we've talked about today, it's very much an individual case-by-case um, rationalisation or discussion of what the benefits versus the side effects. The main reason why we don't jump into second radiation is it's riskier, has more side effects the second time round, particularly if the area of radiation um, is near critical structures such as the brain stem or the optic apparatus. Those structures have a certain threshold or limit of radiation and with the second course of radiation one has to be extremely careful to sculpt dose so that we don't exceed the limit of radiation to those structures such that side effects are higher. So I would say it's not an absolute no, but it's a usually not and it needs to be discussed. Again, Jacob spoke about this term stereotactic, which essentially is this GPS system which both neurosurgeons but also radiation oncologists use. And in terms of considering second time radiation, other factors that we um, consider are what's been the time interval from the first course of radiation to the second, because there is some recovery of the brain over time. How fit is the patient? How well is their um, functional status at the moment? The fitter, the better they are, or the more likely they are to tolerate a second course of radiation. And there are some important technical considerations. So where is the tumour recurrence? How large is it? Where is it located? Is it close to critical structures or is it quite away from that? Um, there aren't any randomised studies. I don't think there ever will be, but it, there are some centres that are doing re-radiation, but again, this is where the multidisciplinary team needs to discuss what's the best strategy for that patient. Um, I won't labour too much on this because I know Jacob spoke about it this morning, but as he said, radiosurgery is actually a misnomer, so it's a bit misleading that term, but it's a type of radiation. It's usually in the context of single high-dose um, treatment of radiation. Um, one can have several treatments, but it's usually that single big-dose radiation with even greater precision because one needs to make sure that the dose doesn't um, necessarily treat normal structures. Just going to um, draw to the close of my talk, give you some examples of how modern radiation is extremely precise in sculpting of dose. This was actually an adolescent with a low grade astrocytoma and you can see that in this particular isodose map or colour map of radiation dose, we use this technique called IMRT or intensity modulated radiation. And essentially what it does is it actually brings multiple leaves or what we call collimations in dynamically, which move in and out of the treatment field as the radiation beam is being delivered. And by doing that, we can actually sculpt the high dose region, but also protect critical structures from dose. 
not only do we plan the radiation exquisitely, but it's one thing to plan it, but you don't just want to deliver it without knowing the accuracy of delivery. So again, most modern radiation centres will actually have facility facilities to be able to assess their daily reproducibility and accuracy of treatment for every single radiation dose. And there's some technical equipment called cone beam CT, which is like a CT, kind of like CT images, not quite as crystal clear, but it allows us to be able to say, yes, this particular treatment is within a millimetre or sub-millimetre accuracy, it's okay to treat. And so the point is that not only the planning, but the on-treatment delivery is all verified extremely accurately as we go on day by day and week by week. I've just got some final closing slides, and I know the, the focus of today's forum has been on primary brain cancer and primary brain tumours, but I do just want to flag a few slides to close about brain metastasis or secondary brain uh, cancer, because radiation has a large role to play in this. There are certain centres within New South Wales and across Australia that have particularly set up stereotactic radiotherapy systems to deliver this kind of treatment, and this is the classical radiosurgery. So it's a very tiny sort of punctate lesion, beautifully round and spherical that is our target, and the, the radiation dose is a single treatment, very high dose, but very rapid fall off of dose so that surrounding tissues are not treated or receive very minimal dose. And this is an example of an isodose map of an older gentleman who had lung cancer with two secondary brain tumours and radiosurgery is one of a perfect system to treat this sort of disease. Um, it's, it's interesting, um, the hippocampus, we've become more and more aware of this structure in the brain called the hippocampus and it's actually one on each side, it's located in the inner aspect of the temporal lobe and the reason why there's been a lot of interest in the hippocampus of recent years, perhaps the five, seven years, is because people appreciate that the limbic system where the hippocampus is it has a lot of um, responsibility for memory, in particular short-term memory and also long-term memory. And it's been increasingly appreciated in other settings such as Alzheimer's disease that the hippocampus is one of the first regions of the brain to suffer damage. So moving then back to the oncology sphere, in the brain metastasis setting, so in the secondary brain cancer setting, there's been quite a shift now to actually saying, can we actually deliver the treatment with high degree of accuracy and good outcome, but also spare important structures, not only the brain stem, not only the optic apparatus and the optic nerves, but importantly, the hippocampus. Because not only do we want people to live long and have quantity of life, we want them to have good quality of life. And so there are many clinical trials going on across Australia uh, and around the world that actually deliver what we call hippocampal avoidance radiation. We know it's safe. We know that most secondary brain cancer is actually away from the hippocampus, so we're not actually shielding our tumour, we're treating the tumour, but actually sparing the hippocampus. And I, I would think that uh, the next logical question is, why don't we use hippocampal avoidance for glioma treatment? Well. I think because um, gliomas tend to be quite infiltrative and we can't, we don't want to spare the tumour whilst we spare the hippocampus, but it's not really mainstream clinical care in the setting of glioma radiation to actually spare the hippocampus, but perhaps we watch this space and that may happen in the near future. So in summary then, just in terms of the four points that I've tried to cover briefly this afternoon. The benefits of radiation, we know that radiation has a very fundamental role, particularly in glioma and high-grade glioma, but also low-grade glioma. We know that it's a survival or life-prolonging treatment for high-grade glioma. We do know that we have to balance the benefits of radiation with some of the concerns, and they do include side effects, both in the short-term, medium and long-term. We know that the radiation timing, the post-operative radiation timing is important because an undue delay can compromise the outcome for that patient. And we know that repeated courses of radiation are reserved for selected patients um, depending on certain clinical and other technical factors. We're very um, blessed that we have um, great advances in technology over the last decade, 15 years, that have allowed us to treat with even greater accuracy, targeting the tumour and sparing normal structures. And then I think then the way forward is, as, he, as the other speakers have said, there's a great deal of enthusiasm and hope. I think radiation will remain a fundamental component of treatment. Um, I think there's obviously a lot of action going on in immunotherapy, as Kerry's outlined um, beautifully today, but radiation, perhaps in synergy with chemotherapy, in synergy with targeted therapies, I think will be definitely a, a space to watch in future. Thanks very much for your attention. All right, um, while Helen 
get set, set up. I think we'll uh, we'll do as we did in the first half of the session with um, holding over questions to pose them to Helen and Sue at the same time. Um, to introduce Helen, she's a, um, again, first choice speaker in the medical oncology slot today. She's uh, obviously one of the most experienced uh, neuro-oncologist, certainly in this state, if not in the country. Um, she's only said one thing wrong so far, and that was about two-year-olds and mobile phones. I'd like to see her... Uh, prize my mobile phone after out of my two and a half year old daughter's hands <laughs> as, without tears as it usually is we all love Peppa Pig but some more than others all right so without any further ado uh, Helen to speak on chemotherapy for brain tumors oh. oh thank you very much um I actually tried to write this talk yesterday um and when I looked at the topic chemotherapy for brain tumors I kind of got to the first slide tamazolamide and couldn't get beyond it so I actually had to get up this morning and think of something else to say so this is a pretty last minute talk um, unfortunately there's very few chemotherapy drugs um, that we still have at clinical level and I'm probably the worst person to talk at the end of the day because I'm bringing this down to earth um, as to what we've actually got in the clinic here and now rather than the wonderful developments that we hope to have in the next two years or so. Page down? It's just page down? Just down our own. Okay. Um, and a lot of it's repeated. Um, we've heard from the surgeons their aim is to um, remove as much malignant tissue as they can without causing um, any permanent damage. And I keep saying to my patients, I'm not treating a good MRI scan, I'm treating a good patient. So I'd prefer someone to walk into the office with a little bit of residual disease, um, but walk into the office and not come into my office in a wheelchair, unable to walk or talk. Um, the other cause for surgery is to provide good samples to the pathologist. And we know at times that all they can do is provide a sample and there is the issue of sampling error. So we need enough for histological diagnosis, we need enough for genetic analysis, but at times we have to go back, look at the MRI and look at where that was taken from and sometimes guess that maybe um, we haven't got enough and maybe what they're calling is as good as they can get, but it might not be accurate. And as an oncologist, we have to make um, an executive decision to go with something different. The aim of chemotherapy can be multiple. Um, we can have multiple aims. The first is to try and mop up anything that's left after surgery. We often do this in combination with radiotherapy. We call it concurrent chemo radiotherapy. Um, and the idea is if we're attacking it with drugs and the radiation oncologist is attacking it with radiation treatment, we're coming at these horrible tumor cells from two different directions and they work together in synergy um, and there can be more effective tumor cell killing. The next aim is to try and control disease if it returns after chemo radiotherapy. One of the major decisions is who should have chemotherapy and there are many factors that go into making that decision. Obviously the pathology comes up, the MRI comes up, and the patient's general health comes up. It's not just based on how old they are, it's their biological age. So if someone has had strokes in the past, if they've got insulin-dependent diabetes, if they've got chronic lung disease, if they've got liver disease, if they've got chronic hepatitis, um, that may point to the fact that temozolomide could reactivate hem hepatitis and cause liver failure. So all those things need to go into the pot when you're trying to decide what they should have. If concurrent with chemotherapy, how much normal brain is going to receive radiation and therefore how much toxicity could we um, um, actually cause by giving these two modalities together? And how much benefit are we going to get and how much are we going to knock these patients down? Because is it going to put them out of action for three or four months because this, this treatment is going to be quite toxic? Um, for a gain of one or two months of extra survival. And we put all those things into a big melting pot and try and decide what's best for an individual at the time. Michael's discussed pathology at length. He's looking at, the, they, pathologists look at things down the microscope. And neuropathologies once, um, down the microscope is one of the most difficult pathologies we can ask for. Um, and even the world experts, if we send a pathology to NYU, MD Anderson, 
um, UCLA, we could come back with three different answers just by looking down the microscope. So given controversy, it's not because someone's got it wrong, it's because we don't really know. These things can be very difficult in world expert hands. Um, sometimes, as I said, the tumour can only be biopsied and we're not sure if they've actually got the most representative part of the lesion. And sometimes tumours actually contain both high-grade and low-grade elements. Treatment decisions are often made in our department at what we call an MDT meeting. We look at the MRI scan, we look at what has been taken out, what has been left behind, and potentially also if the patient's had um, pet imaging, um, is the pet hot, is the pet cold, and is this representative of what we think um, it is, and we, our pathologists will often come along and that may influence their path reports. And sometimes pathologists will obviously seek second opinions. So MDTs we are finding more and more useful. Um, we have the luxury of having one once a week. They're meant to be for an hour and they usually go for three. Some people walk out early. Um, and we're just trying to fit patients into the right box for the right treatment um, and work out what treatment, um, what tumours we're dealing with. Uh, this is, an, you know, Michael shown you the H&E scan, the, scan um, the pictures, they're pink and blue, who knows. Um, it looks at the shapes of the cells, whether there's dead stuff there, is there any abnormal blood vessels. They then add these little bottles of brown stuff um, that may be positive or negative. Um, and, um, you know, there is, unfortunately, around Australia, um, people that will take great care You'll get a block of tissue set in wax. Some people will take five, six, ten different layers through that block and examine the lot. And some will take the top layer, go, oh, it's X, goodbye, that's it. And if we see second opinions, sometimes we'll actually ask for the block and ask one of our local pathologists to take a whole lot more cuts, do a whole lot more stains and have a bit of a better look. Um, we cannot, sometimes we won't even get an immunocytochemistry stain done at the local pathology. Um, things that we look at is something called a key 67 that gives us an idea of how many cells are dividing at any one time, usually indicative of how aggressive they are. P53 is a protein that might say this may have started as a low grade and gone to a high grade. The IDH, the ATRX, EGFR, which is another surface receptor, and this rare thing called BR, um, BRAF, which is usually found in melanoma and occasionally very rare um, adult brain tumours. Then genetic testing, um, we've talked about the chromosomes and the fish staining, which are very pretty. Um, and um, it's been routinely available in Australia for about 15 years, but it's a send-off to specialised labs. It takes about 10 days. The dyes for those pretty pictures are very expensive and there's no government reimbursement. Michael's explained about MGMT. Um, that is also quite useful for us in deciding treatment. No government reimbursement and he's explained how MGMT may help us decide whether or not we should just give chemotherapy to some patients who are not going to tolerate um, both chemo and radio, um, and whether or not they're sensitive to get potentially sensitive to temozolomide. On the other hand, great test, but one patient who we had no relapse in with a grade four glioma and confirmed multiple times was in remission for nine years and was unmethylated. So, you know, it's really great, but you can't go black and white. Um, and given that we don't have an option, it's a bit tough. So we've talked about MGMT, so the cows come home. We can then go on to genomic sequencing, personalised medicine, matching the genomic profile to what drugs might be sensitive. Um, the first human genome project now started um, with Bill Clinton's pushing, three B, cost $3.8 billion, took the, um, 13 years to complete um, and was extre you know, extremely time consuming, extremely um, um, expensive. And sequencing, if you were one of the lucky labs, there was 26 labs for 26 chromosomes around the world and their labs looked like this and cost a fortune. And we can now get a desktop sequencer for about 60,000. Unfortunately, it costs 
couple of thousand plus to run a limited sequence. So we can now say we're probably interested in about 200 genes in a glioma um, and we can run that on the desktop and then we get a mountain of information from those coloured little dots on the right hand side. And then we need something called a bioinformatician, which is some young boy with a brain the size of a planet to analyze this statistically, what does it mean? Um, and then they, I asked them to come up with a report and it means A, B, C or D, not <laughs> um, But there is some fantastic um, people around now that will come up and say, look, you know, this matches this, matches this, matches this, um, and it's going to be the way to go in the future. Um, beware the internet is all I can say. There are a number of companies that are offering this genomic testing online, and there are a number of my patients that have paid out their 8,000 bucks and come to me with a 50-page genomic test in front of them. Some of these companies are very legitimate, some of them are not so legitimate. Um, as I said, they usually cost 8,000 bucks. And what they do is they match your tumor limited genome to a whole lot of drugs they know about, which are usually for prostate cancer, breast cancer, and lung cancer. And then they come in and say, could I have some tamoxifen, which is the breast cancer hormone gene, for my brain tumor? And you go, well, <laughs> Maybe not. Or this brand new prostate drug that we don't have in Australia, that we don't know crosses the blood-brain barrier. So although, yes, that probably will be the way to go in the future, there's, it's not proving so good right now on my desk. And it can cost a lot of money. So even though what is abnormal in a lung cancer, say the EGFR receptor, um, will be tested in your $8,000 genome panel, the EGFR receptor anomaly in a lung cancer is not necessarily the EGFR receptor anomaly in a brain tumour. We have problems because when we first saw the EGFR receptor anomaly in brain tumours, we did a clinical trial with the EGFR um, brain cancer, um, lung cancer drug in brain tumours, and guess what? It didn't work. One of the problems was probably a problem with drug delivery. The other thing was that it probably was not the same target, even though it was the same kind of gene. And the other thing is when it got there, it didn't knock the target down. So there's a lot more work that we need to do. Um, we need to know that the drugs get delivered. Um, many drugs don't cross the blood-brain barrier. And if they do cross the blood-brain barrier, they've got to cross the blood-brain barrier at doses that knock down the target and actually kill the tumour cell. And the targets can be different in lung cancer as they are in brain cancer. And the pathways that are controlled by these receptors can be different in brain cancer than they are in lung cancer. So all this kind of work needs to get sorted. <coughs> and this is just a cartoon of the EGFR pathway. So one of the problems with some of these targeted therapies is, as Kerry pointed out, this bit of tumour might have an EGFR receptor problem, this bit might not. So we get what we call tumour heterogeneity. This bit is different to that bit. And we can't genetically analyse 50 different bits of tumour. Um, it's $50,000 a pop. <laughs> so um, we need to try and get a pattern of what is driving every little bit? So if they all look a bit different, but if we know which bit is the same and driving all those other little bits, we're going to get to the root of the problem and have better success with targeted therapies. And if tumours have survived the first onslaught of our therapy, it's going to be a pretty brave person that sees someone with a GBM that doesn't give them chemo RT if they're young and fit and healthy. And if all we have to test is their first tumour, we know the first onslaught of our radiation and poison is going to change what we now have to do. So if you go back to the tumour that you've got in Michael's lab, in the wax block, it is not necessarily going to be the same as what you now have regrowing. So doing a genomic analysis on your original tumour at recurrence is not necessarily going to be the same. So are you up for another biopsy or another resection? Great, then, yes, sure, that might be quite good. But 
is just there's a few tricks for young players. So blocking one pathway is not necessarily going to fix it because these are sneaky little numbers. Um, and if you block one pathway, they're going to activate another pathway. And it's going to be combination therapy that we need. So where are we currently up to with all this? So the last chemo drug we had for this was released 15 years ago. That's pretty damn pathetic, you know. Temidol, 2000, 15 years ago. Bevacizumab, it's a great palliative drug. Very expensive steroid, but a lot better than steroids in some patients. And it's certainly, I've had patients that are semi-conscious that are fishing in seven days' time, and it's made a huge difference to their quality of life. So it's not to be written off, but it doesn't generally kill cancer for very long. Um, it was approved in Australia in 2009 for relapse GBM. The government didn't put their money where their mouth was. It still cost, is now costing patients up to $20,000 to have um, um, Avastin, Bevacizumab. It can make a huge difference to the way they feel, a huge difference to a short period of their lives, but it's still not fixing the problem that patients want to fix, which is kill my cancer. A couple of old drugs have made re-emergence, um, something called lomustine. So just to confuse patients and doctors, it has another name called carmustine or CCNU. Um, and it's, um, it's been around for 40, 50 years. Um, it's pretty well tolerated. It's sometimes combined with a drug called procarbazine. Neither of these drugs are funded by the government. Um, they kind of went into disrepute, taken off the PBS. They're not too expensive, um, and they're back in favour um, and can become in short supply. They can just disappear from the shelf because the one or two places around the world that make them decide we're not going to make them this week and we can't get hold of them. Um, and this is just some milestones, really showing nothing much has happened. Um, so current therapies that we have depend on your diagnosis, your general health, the extent of resection, I mean, some people with low-grade tumours may be instantly referred for therapy because we can't control the seizures. And being on five different seizure medications versus having some radiotherapy and coming off all your seizure meds and coming off all your steroids is, like, fantastic. Um, other patients might not need any therapy at all for 10 years. So in, all those things need to be considered when we decide whether we're going to treat you or not. Um, GBM, most common form, uh, form of tumours in adults, GBM in kids and GBMs in adults are completely different diseases. If you do the genomic analysis, no, no, no comparison. Um, and there's a fantastic group um, that uh, happened to be at a science conference, and I understood about that much, but all I got out of it really was that um, it's genomically completely different. Um, there's 350 cases in Europe per annum, and the work they're doing over there is mind-blowing. So um, I can tell you a bit about that at another time, um, but certainly the paediatric guys and us don't have much in common anymore. Um, treatment, as I said, um, depends on a lot of factors. Um, usually the good old Temidol for six weeks concurrent with radiotherapy, followed by six months of Temidol. More is not necessarily better. Um, the trials in the state said doubling the dose or increasing it to 12 months didn't make a scrap of difference, except to the amount of side effects we got. Side effects of Temidol are usually relatively rare. I've had two patients in the last 12 months that have bad, bad nausea and vomiting, no matter what I get, I've given them. Um, and in the last 20 years, I can't say I've seen anyone, so I don't know really what's going on. But um, we usually give everyone really strong nausea drugs to start with and back off rather than wait for them to get sick and then try and add them on. And with that policy, we rarely get anyone that gets sick. Rarely do you get hair loss. Um, and with radiotherapy, in the old days, people were bald for life, but um, it usually starts regrowing after modern radiotherapy within a couple of months, and it's rare to see that you've had a, it, when it first comes back after radiotherapy, it comes back, can come back curly in a different colour. I had a patient who had this streak of orange hair amongst all the grey, and he came in and said, look what your chemotherapy's done to me. <laughs> I have an orange streak of hair. And I'm going, oh, blame the radiotherapist for that one. 
Temidol very rarely causes hair loss. Um, it can drop immune cells. There's a lot of different immune cells around. Most chemo drops neutrophils, which pre, um, gives you bacterial infections. Temidol causes a drop in lymphocytes, which are the ones that fight viruses, fungus, and protozoans, which are pretty rare. And they're also lowered by dexamethasone. So sometimes patients are on prophylactic antibiotics um, or antiviral therapies. Um, temidol is in a drug um, a class of drugs called alkylating agents and it can affect fertility. Um, I've actually been blamed for a few accidental pregnancies. Um, so it's not that common but we do offer sperm banking to men if they want and um, we have found from breast cancer literature that if we put women on um, ovarian suppression, well, in ovarian, in breast cancer, if we suppress ovarian function in women, we can um, keep them, um, we have a better fertility rate. So we offer that to women if they want it. Um, there are about one in a hundred women who are hypersensitive to Temidol and get very low blood counts um, within the first couple of weeks and, and don't recover. Um, and for some reason seem to do very well in the long term. And I can't explain it. It happens here, it happens in America, and we haven't been able to predict it, and we just watch it and monitor blood counts quite carefully. With grade two and three tumours, recent data suggests that um, if you're going to need treatment, so once we decided if you got a grade two or a grade three and you need treatment, giving sequential chemo followed by radio or radio followed by chemo doubles life expectancy. So. For those patients who've been through an MDT, yes, you're going to need treatment. Having both modalities is important. A lot of patients uh, in grade twos might not need treatment. Grade threes do need treatment. So sequential treatment seems to be important. This was based on trials that started in the early 1990s. In the 1990s, we didn't have Temidol. So it was based on a group of drugs called PCV combination therapy. This is not nice. So. Evidence-based medicine says we should be using PCV. I've never given that. Um, Evidence-based medicine says we should be giving that. So, I don't know. I'm probably very bad. Um, but the results took 20 years to reach these conclusions. Um, and uh, 20, 20 years to do the trials and reach these final conclusions. And in that time, a lot of things have changed. Temidol came up. Um, and it would, it would take another 20 years to start it all over again and put Temidol into the mix. So I'm really not sure how that's going to happen. And we are now in the era of genomic medicine. None of these trials involved IDH, which we think is going to have a very significant pro prognostic um, factor in all this. We didn't have ATRX, we didn't have TERT. So is it okay that we go back and retrospectively analyse these tumours and work out should have these patients had chemo, chemo radio? Can we use this retrospective data to get some of these drugs pushed through the regulatory offices? Or do we have to do formal trials that take 20, 30 years, by which time everything will have changed all over again? I'm a pusher. Some people are a let's get evidence-based medicine. <laughs> anyway. Clinical trials, Kerry's talked about, um, everything's discovered in a test tube followed by a poor rat or mouse and then they need to go into human guinea pigs. Um, one in 10,000 things that come through the lab actually get into humans um, and it takes an average of 10 years and a billion dollars. Um, there's been a propensity to want well, the phase three trials where you have people on a control arm, people on a um, treatment, you know, investigational arm, hundreds and hundreds of patients, years and years and years of investigation, and billions and millions of dollars. And there is a big push now to do something like Barkus basket trials where we take a group of 20 patients, okay, that's what their results are, have a baseline as your standard control, add a different drug, compare those patients, move on to the next lot, and try and get these results through in a much more rapid fashion and, and get them through to the clinical levels. We've got to convince the regulators that if we find these results quickly, they will regulate the drugs and put them in through the government um, so that we can get access in the clinic. So there's a lot of regulatory work to do as well. Um, and brain tumours are unique. We need to find different new targets. We need to know if they knock down 
um, there's a lot of things to be done. Um, the fields of research, targeted therapies, intratumoral therapies, the vaccines, the checkpoint inhibitors, um, not all immune cells are good. So Kerry described how there are the good immune cells that are attacking the baddies and the bad immune cells that are protecting the baddies. And the aim of some of this immune therapy is to knock down the baddies and get the goodies going. Unfortunately, <laughs> what's happening in some of these checkpoint inhibitor trials is that you know, they're turning on the immune system real well and they're attacking the baddies real well and the brains are blowing up. So one doesn't actually um, tolerate a big swollen metastases in the brain. Um, and we're all kind of, they did a trial when they combined a PD-1 inhibitor and ipilimumab in the States and they actually pulled the ipi because they were getting so much brain swelling, um, <laughs> um, it wasn't a very good look. So there's a lot of work to do. How can we attack, how can we control the immune response in the brain because there's nowhere for a swollen brain to go. Um, and get the good effects without actually um, getting all the bad effects that we're quite concerned about. Um, the cannabis story, I know that was going to be pretty hot. Um, it contained, cannabis leaf contains 100, uh, 400 chemicals. Now, if you went to your GP and he gave you 400 different antibiotics for one kind of infection, you would probably say he was nuts. But if you go to your herbalist or your local supplier and they give you a cannabis oil containing 400 different chemicals, you go, whoopee, I've got the new cure for a brain tumour. Um, so there is an awful lot of work to do on this to work out what is safe, what is real, what is going to help, what is not going to help, what is toxic, what isn't. Um, and extracting the oil in the kitchen is not a great idea. I had one poor um, husband of one of my patients who came in with his arm bandaged from here to here with third degree burns as he was trying to extract cannabis oil in the kitchen and it didn't kind of work that good. So she was minus a carer for a few weeks and he was having burns dressing. So um, there is a few scientific reports. It's, I, I mean, I'm kind of a bit open-minded. Um, CBD, as I said before, has been purified and in the children's trials that started over 12 months ago in the States, there is a role for it in some children with seizures um, and it's being taken forward in proper controlled trials. Some children respond, some don't. They're trying to work out who, who it's good for and who isn't and what dose it should be used at. Um, some backyard extractors are actually making a poison which actually promotes seizures. Some are making good stuff potentially, but who knows because we don't really know what they're extracting. Um, and they could be actually extracting the toxic components, not the real stuff. Um, rat studies have shown that a certain mixture may be good, um, but we need to know the ratio, we need to know the mixture before we go much further. Um, there are anecdotal reports on the web and looking at the scans, um, some of those reports look okay, but we really need the pathology, who, what kind of tumour is responding, what isn't responding, before everyone in the world is putting marijuana in the water. Um, and as I said, the New South Wales government is making an attempt to try and bring some of this into the, you know, more conventional side of things. Um, not all natural products are safe, so don't be a victim of the net. And please don't expect your doctor to know all about the potential interactions, benefits and harm of everything, you know. It's not uncommon as a doctor to have a patient walk in with a shopping bag full of organic natural supplements claimed to stimulate the immune cells. Well, maybe it's a good cell, good immune cells, maybe it's a bad immune cells. Then they're meant to help brain infection, you know, in, um, brain function, improve metabolism, um, you know, these repurposed drugs which are based on genomic pathways, which are all put together, um, claiming success without publishing a damn thing on the internet. Um, I'm pretty getting pretty old and cranky, and I'm starting to say, well, why don't you go ask your naturopath and herbalist, you know? They say to me, is this safe to say take with chemotherapy or have with radiotherapy? Well, why don't you go and ask your naturopath, is this... Temidol, safe to have with this bag full of stuff. You know, is it safe? Oh, I don't know. You know, put it back on them. Um, antioxidants can neutralise some effects of radiotherapy. 
fish oil has now been reported to interfere with chemotherapy and coagulation. Um, and factors in your immune system could actually be protecting the baddies. So what components of your immune system are they actually stimulating? I don't know. One of the problems at the moment is we are not making the most of what we currently have. And you need to question, should every neurosurgeon be operating on brain tumours, really? I mean, a great scan does not always equal a great patient. Orthopaedic surgeons no longer operate on knees, hips, elbows and toes. You know, you go to an orthopod, I'm the, I'm the hip guy, I'm the knee guy, I'm the elbow guy and I'm the shoulder guy. Should every pathologist be reporting on gliomas? This is a really specialised field, which in the States, there is a neuro specialist neuropathologist um, that, that gets to see these and, and try and give us the best report we can. We'll do the extra immunocytochemistry, rem, you know, recommend um, um, genomics and help. Um, should the, every case be discussed at an MDT? And the next problem is getting all that genomic will cost you a thousand bucks. There is no government funding for any of this. So should every radiation oncologist who is doing breast radiotherapy, doing lung radiotherapy, doing prostate radiotherapy, be doing brain radiotherapy? Don't know, a bit challenging, probably, just as well, there's not a lot of radiotherapists and neurosurgeons in the room. Anyway, so, and should every radiologist be putting on MRI scans? I mean, in the, in the old days, everyone had progressive disease after radiotherapy because everyone had the effects of radiotherapy on their brain. Yeah. And the poor patients would read the report, and, oh, you know, it's really bad. Well, jeepers, the radiotherapy is actually working. You look fantastic. Do you get it that, you know, we, the, what looks like tumour is actually um, your radiation effect? And it's just that they don't know what you've had. They don't know how to report the scans because they haven't read what treatment you're having. They don't pull out the previous images and see, you know, on low grades, you need to pull out images from three years ago and see what the change is, not what the change is was, was over six months. These things creep up on us and you need to be diligent and it takes more time. And if you're in private practice, you're given five minutes a scan or 10 or whatever. So. Looking after those people that we have now, there is a whole lot of stuff about we need more money for research, but we need more allied health, nursing, pharmacists, physios, psychologists, rehabs, um, centres that will take patients with brain tumours. Okay, if you've had a stroke and you're 85, or too bad if you're 32 and got a brain tumour. I mean, huh. carer support, financial stress. I mean, the first thing you do is you can't work, well, you can't get on Centrelink, or, well, you know, I can't, couldn't get my father through Centrelink anyway. I mean, even if you're with it, you can't negotiate that one. I mean, we need respite resorts. We need somewhere where patients and carers can go and have a bit of fun. You know, not an old nursing home. You want a bit of a massage, some food, some movies, somewhere in the beach. You know, I mean, we have none of this for our patients and our carers, and it's just pretty tough out there. So. We don't have all the answers. Everyone is very vulnerable. If you've got a child that's sick, you're just open the door to anyone that can convince you that they've got an answer. Um, we need to make sure that our current patients are getting the best we can. We need to work 10 times harder on our research projects and find better solutions. We need better awareness. I mean, and thank heavens for Carrie Bickmore and the um, Logies um, and hope everyone will get through behind brain cancer and research. Um, and trillions of millions of money into the community so that um, we can get help for the current patients and carers with this dreadful disease. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Um, hopefully one of your sons will shout you a weekend at a respite resort for Mother's Day. Um, <laughs> no, excellent talk, as always, and I'm sure we're all... Uh, I uh, feel the privilege of having everyone speak in this session. Um, we're kind of a bit over time, so we might just defer to afternoon tea now. And that really brings to a conclusion the formal part of the program today. Um, most of us who spoke um, in this last session, and myself and a few of the others from the parallel session will be around. We, we were basically going to grab a cup of tea or coffee and then come back into this room. And, and please feel free to approach us with any questions um, that you might have. 
um, obviously particularly for Sue and Helen because we didn't really get to ask any questions. Um, if I can just you know, take the opportunity again to thank all of the um, sponsors who, uh, who without their contribution today would not have taken place. Um, so Cancer Council, um, Kill Brain Cancer Foundation, SNOG, the Yellow Diamond Foundation and Brainstorm, if we can all put our hands together again for them. Um, and um, to everyone else who helped with the organisation of, uh, of today, um, Susan Pitt had to leave early, but, but without her support and uh, BTAA's support, things wouldn't have happened today. And there's a number of others who've also uh, helped a lot uh, behind the scenes. Um, I'd also like to thank all the speakers. Obviously, today was a completely voluntary thing for, for them, for everyone who's uh, come along and spoken today as well. So uh, I greatly appreciate that. And if you can th uh, join me in thanking them as well. Um, and, and to you all, I commend you all for coming along and taking the time out of whatever you're doing um, today. Uh, although probably Kerry's lab are pretty glad to you know not be working. No, um, they. Uh, I hope you've all learned something. Uh, I hope you've taken the opportunity to network with other people. Um, obviously, a lot of you are in similar boats, but um, as a patient, as a carer, as a health professional, um, we all need each other in this sort of a, an environment. And I really uh, uh, hope you've taken the opportunity to to meet some people. Um, we'll leave it there for uh, afternoon tea. But if you have any other uh, questions, please feel free to approach any of us. Um, and thank you all again, and we'll probably be back next year, I'd imagine. <laughs>